were just talking about sushi. What's up, Dave? Hey, how we're, are you? We're live now. I'm really fucking great, man. I just ate uh, a bunch of sushi and I had it on my teeth. I was flossing. I was telling you. That's what happens when I eat it. It just it, it sticks in because of the rice, but it's worth it because I like it. What's your favorite kind of sushi? Mm, there's like a dragon roll in Dallas that they send me that's got like crab in it and shrimp. I, I don't know exactly what they put in it, but it's delicious. Did you see that video of how they make fake crab meat? No, but I have a feeling it's going to be ruined for it's me now. It's freaking disgusting, dude. I, I don't know if I can play it without getting some sort of copyright strike, so I don't want to mess with it too much. But let me see if I can. Let me see if I can. Fake crab meat. Dude, this is nasty. It's like I used to eat this stuff when I was a kid. I'd get like pack. I don't. I, oh, here it is. Oh, God. Is this? Oh, it? me too. Like even on uh, like Christmas and stuff, my Nana would put it out. This is just an image of what you can imagine. I mean. Oh, <laughs> it, it's it's not real crab and it it's was cement it said imitation crab meat on the package but i was just like yeah whatever but it tastes good yeah like you figured they eat something fish ish <laughs> and then they'll put ice in it here i'll play like two seconds of it i don't i don't even want to play it i don't even want to i don't oh, even want to like a paper it. shredder and then, <laughs> it's so so foul dude oh no do you eat like a lot of fake food anymore not really. Like, I mean, I do eat some, I do eat more processed food, I guess, than I want to, but I've been way, way more conscious about it than when I was younger. Yep. Is it because you're on the road? Mainly, yeah. And it's like sometimes you just have to get something. Um, and that's why. But otherwise, I really try to like stick to it. Like, and I'm losing a little bit of weight because of it, but I'm really just trying to see if, if I can live longer, because I think a lot of people are just dropping dead from our generation from like the microwave diet and just no doubt, you know, just growing up on processed food, like all that nonsense that, you know, and I try to keep my kid away from it as much as possible. But they're kids. They're going to go for candy. They're going to go for stuff when you're not around. Regardless, I get uh, kind of concerned about those azo dyes, which is like synthetic being synthetic, basically made yeah. from petroleum, like red 40 and all that crap. Well, it's amazing just like the plastic and poison that they just put in everything when we were growing up. And now we're finding out about it. And it's like, well, these things cause cancer. It's like, well, apparently everything just gave us cancer that we were being exposed to all the time. I, something in like, I think it was 92 is when high fructose hit the scene. Were you yeah. like a big soda drinker? Big time. I was, my mom wouldn't let us have it in the house, but I would like sneak it. One time she, I, she called my friend's mom. She's like, Becky, you you're not going to guess what I found from Ian and Josh that Ian was hiding in his room. And Becky was like, oh my God, what was it? She's like, Pepsi. And it was like, oh, uh, who, who fucking cares? It's, it's like, oh, so no drugs or porn? No, no, yeah. no. It was the hard stuff. Yeah. It, yeah. This wasn't even diet, which is somehow like, worse. I would sneak cubes of Pepsi up into my room and like hide them. It was so, but then, it, then they invented high fructose and God knows what that's doing to people. Yeah, I remember the one thing that I, I don't know if it's around anymore, like they lowered the caffeine intake, but it was Jolt. Oh, yeah. Do you remember Jolt? Jolt was, Cola. Yes, it was like the extra amount of caffeine. And it was like when you were about <laughs> seven, it was the first high you'd experience. Because you I, and your friends would like chug a two liter behind like a 7-Eleven and then see how fast you could ride your bikes until oh, you crashed. Yeah. At least yeah, we would. But I, I'm not even sure if it's around anymore. I, we had a, I'd always had a hard time finding that stuff. It wasn't as proliferative as like the Pepsi and the Coke and even Mountain Dew. I mean, a lot, I guess it wasn't a Pepsi. Probably must have been. I don't know who made it, but it probably wasn't Pepsi or Coke. Or or if it was, I don't know. I don't think it was. I could be wrong. It was like one of those RC cola things. Oh, okay. And I think, but I but then you had the yeah Mountain Dew for some reason in the nineties became like do the do everybody's like surfing on a green wave and then they <laughs> yeah. they came up with like the red one and then they had like the octane and like every there all of a sudden there's like five different colors of it like just this unbelievable assortment of like white it was like the first energy drink that didn't it, really oh the white one that more energy yeah i never yes. had it was it like yeah. actually white or was it clear I think it was clear, but I could be wrong. Because I still remember, Chris, I'm sure you do, Crystal Clear Pepsi. Yeah. When that was their big thing, the Van Halen song, and it looks like they're pouring water while they're biking. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> like, they were all exercising in the commercial, but it's really just Pepsi that you can't see. 
was that like Pepsi without the one of those without the food coloring? That's what it was. Like they took out the syrup and everything else was in there. And then they acted like it was like, yeah, this is a healthier. They didn't say it, but they just implied it in the commercial with people playing basketball and, and rollerblading. That, I, that's like the biggest upgrade of my life was cutting that stuff out. I think the soda. Oh, it'd be so funny if you sw- I'm on tea. Soda. Oh, I know. I'm on tea. Sweet I know tea. it's not great for you, but it's, I have Barrett's esophagus now, probably from years of well, that and alcoholism, but um, I like my, my throat's all messed up. And I think it is from just years and years of drinking as much soda as, as humanly possible. What, what is it called? Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus. It was who's Barrett like a dude? I think Barrett may have been the first guy to have it. <laughs> and it's just basically like your esophagus slowly erodes away, but they start giving you medicine. So hopefully it begins to heal. Um, or it turns into throat cancer and you die. We'll see. Only time will tell. It's a roll you, of the dice. You read this stuff? Coconut oil? No, I've heard of it. It's fucking amazing. It'll like regrow. I don't I can't, I'm not a doctor, but it seems to like be really good for skin like inflammation of any kind and it really it's actually good for your teeth too like they do oil pulling where they'll do coconut oil swish it around for like five minutes in the mouth and then spit it out and it regrows the enamel like uh remineralizes the enamel i gotta try it i just started taking this one thing it's green it's a it's a uh hold on i get it i hope it's nice. okay hold on yeah i'm gonna i'm um, gonna please the crowd while you're out uh, Dave Landau, ladies and gentlemen, that would be DaveLandau.com. I feel like I feel like people think we're doing a sponsor, and I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like it, this: I just take on the ropes of vitamin, but it's this primal green stuff. And like I take it in the morning. That's just like a scoop of powder with like every vitamin imaginable in it, and it's unbelievable how much better I feel just drinking that and then not eating anything for the first part of the day. That's awesome. Is it with it's with water and just the powder? Just water and the powder. That's it. Wow. I do. I've been doing coffee. Do you do coffee anymore? I do. I, I, I have a real, I, I don't know if I can ever give that up. Cause I started drinking coffee when I was probably, my mom started giving it to me and she was a nurse, but she started giving it to me when I was about eight or nine. So I've just been a coffee drinker my whole life. Well, like when you would sit at the table with her or something. Yeah. Like in the morning, like if they had breakfast or whatever I was, and I was always like one of the first ones up. Cause, and I just never slept well ever. So it was like, I would have coffee before school in like junior high, you know, it was, it was nothing that was that, that strange to me. So I've, it's always been kind of part of my diet. I quit caffeine for three months and I will say I've gotten off of everything, nicotine, all that stuff. There is nothing harder to kick than caffeine because I eventually went right back to it. Oh, wow. What was it like the first week? Like when you were off? Oh, dude, dizzy headaches, uh, just, it was painful, like migraines. Um, you're, you're just, it's, you're shaking it out of your system. And, and at that point I was drinking way too much of it. Like I had to stop, you know, and, but then eventually you have to wake up like as a comic, go do morning radio, you're exhausted. Coffee's right there. You're just going to go back to it like a fish to water. It's Yeah, I'm it, IRL, it's 8 to 11, and I'm like, oh, God, some nights I'm just like, give me a little snippet of caffeine. Yeah, It's not so bad. I mean, it's it's not bad in the right dose, but, I mean, it's a it's a powerful substance. Uh, I was going to say something about it. Oh, yeah, did you, like, doctor it up when you were a kid? Because I always found it super bitter when I was a kid. I couldn't. Uh, I did. I definitely threw in cream or at least milk. We never really had cream in the house, where I would throw in cream and a little bit of sugar, or, like milk and sugar and that kind of thing. And then every now and then, if my mom wasn't looking, I'd like dump Hershey syrup in it or something, you know, just to like add add some flavor to it. Um, but yeah, I never drank in like a crazy whipped cream coffee drink until I was like a fully grown man at a Starbucks. And yeah. I was like, what's that milkshake looking thing? Is that coffee? That, that always tricks me out when people are like, I love chocolate. And I'm like, well, I think you mean you love sugar in that, in whatever it's in. Because if you eat chocolate, it's super bitter. It tastes like iron you know like coffee grounds basically which is i like it but yeah it's It's true though people like processed sugar or processed chocolate they don't actually i don't think they really like the real chocolate and i'll be honest i love processed chocolate uh it's it's delightful i try not to eat as much of it but yeah the real chocolate and, and chocolate it's not the same it's all in the sugar which i think is 
I think that's the thing that I think most Americans have this addiction to, whether they're aware of it or not, is is sugar. Yeah, man. I I think it's a drug. I mean, they call it a right. food, but it is the inflammation that it caught. I don't know if it causes inflammation. I can't tell exactly. And then there's so many types of it too. Like glucose is sugar. It's a simple sugar your body needs. So that's kind of misleading because like sucralose and high fructose corn syrup and aspartame, they're sweet, but they're not glucose. So. Right. No, I agree. I think, I, and when you look at it, like over time, the way that people have marketed their products, they've always put stuff in to try to get you coming back. And especially in that food industry, you know, the, the farther you dig into it. So you do have that. I mean, it is a trick to get you to come back and eating as much as sugar as possible. Like they want you to enjoy it. They want you to get a dopamine release from your food, not just like the satisfaction of nutrients. And I mean, it works, dude. Like I, I've had, I think everybody has their eating battles, but you know, it, it's definitely effective. And I had me, a, that's a oh, drug. Uh, sorry, yeah. I, I went through a phase, I guess I was 28. I ate all this Easter candy. It was like um, a bunch of Kit Kat, little Kit Kats and uh, mm -hmm. Easter chocolate Easter eggs. But I yeah. ate both bags. It was like two big bags, one of each. And I broke out as this like disgusting herpes looking rash on my um, it was outside on Jeez. my like liver or something on the skin. Oh. I was like, what the fuck? It like opened up and I was like, this is going to kill me. Like it was like acute, acute, some kind of acute poisoning. And I don't know if it was your fake sugar or what it was, but I, I cut it out after that by like 90% and it's never had, I've never had. And I noticed like oh. sweat, less swelling. My cuts will heal faster. That's for sure. And well, if you, if, at least for me, if I eat something now, like with my kid, I go get ice cream or something. If it's late, whatever, and he wants to get some ice cream, I'll go with them. But the next morning, dude, I feel like I've been doing keg stands all night. Like I, I just, I feel like I've just been like chugging whiskey, and I wake up and I'm like, "What did I do?" And it's like I had been chocolate chip at 9 p.m. Like that's the effect that I feel. It's just like I was out raving. Yeah, and that shit that lives on it, the bacteria goes into your stomach, and then it tell. I think it tells the body like, "I want more of what I like," which is that thing, that sugar. And so you're like. Why do I crave this stuff right now? Because that fucking candida or whatever the, the bacteria is, is like commanding your nervous system. Yeah, it's crazy how many different things go into that where you start craving it, too. And like it's, uh, you know, it's like diabetics crave sugar, diabetic, you know, it's it's all it's all kind of under that umbrella. And like as I'm getting older, just like that's some something that I'm trying to be way more mindful of, because I know a lot of the times I feel like crap. But just by cutting out a lot of soda, not eating late. Like I probably lost 20 pounds in the last three months, like not, you know, anything that's like amazing, but just by small adjustments that are shockingly small, the oh, amount what? of weight you can, you can, you can use. What did you like, do? Lose. Like, let's say if I, uh, like the other day I had a Kit Kat for the first time in like a month, I didn't buy a King size. I just ate two of them and then threw it away. Stuff like that. Like, um, instead of getting, any sort of pop soda, anything I drink, tea, coffee, that's it. No, I don't put anything in my coffee. Dude. Um, lower carbs. That's what I, I've noticed. But I'll still eat a little bit, but I, I won't I won't just sit there like eating bread at a restaurant, waiting for food. Like can't you know, and I was very much that guy. I had a dream. This is reminding me, I think it was last night. I, I just had this dream that I ate someone handed me like a Butterfinger bar or like a, some Snickers or something. And I ate a piece and I was like, this is too sugary for me. I'll just take a little bit. And I broke it off and gave them back like 80% of the bar. Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe that's why I'm talking about it. Yo, it, wait, yeah. Stop. Wait, you, at least it, you're, you're cutting in and out. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Your audio is cutting in and out. What were you saying? Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. I'm in a hotel in Syracuse, so we're we're really relying on uh, some interesting Wi-Fi right it, now. It looks fantastic. Your resolution is wonderful. I'm 480 or something. Yeah, okay. I was doing the best. I can. <laughs> Do, where are you on the road? You're on the road touring. Yeah, I'm in Syracuse, New York, right now. What are you doing? What's uh, the funny, uh, the funny bone, right now this week. So, are you touring? Do you tour like sporadically, or do you go on like extended mo maneuvers? Um, I tour pretty constantly, but it's it, uh, not sporadically. It's it's sort of um, I don't go for like on the road for weeks at a time. I never have, but I'll go out on weekends and like three days a week, stuff like that. Now that I have a kid, though, I limit it. 
uh, compared to what I used to do, especially because I'm in Dallas shooting normal world all week. And uh, so I have to, you know, I don't, I don't hit it as hard as I once did. Like at one point in my career it was, you know, sort of that, you know, five days a week sort of on the road grinding. And now it's, I'm lucky enough to where I really only do Fridays and Saturdays. Is life just like so much better with a kid? It's uh, unbelievably better because it gives you purpose. That's what I'm missing in my life half the time. Like, <laughs> this, yeah, this kind of thing's awesome. Like, I feel like I'm contributing to the species, but, and not, it just doesn't like, I don't want to play video games all day. And I'm like, after this interview, I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do with my day? Like, I can play, I just played guitar for an hour. Uh, I guess That's I could make it. Yeah, yeah, it's contribution. But like you say, it gives the purpose of like raising a child. It's got to be. I mean, I'm talking about it like I sound like a probably a 12 year old being like, what's it like? Yeah. Well, I had no idea. Like, we didn't even plan on having kids. And all, you know, my wife got pregnant. I was uh, 32, she was 34. So it was just one of those things that, you know, we weren't really sure if it was going to, you know, and we didn't really know what to do because nobody knows how to be a parent. That's the amazing thing. Like you go into it as blind as everybody. And that's where I started having sympathy for my parents, I guess, empathy, but sympathy for the way I behaved. And I, I, you start looking at it in a different way. Like you're just learning as they're learning how to do this and how to raise another human being and how to pass on knowledge and information and, there's so much information available now. What do you pass on to your kid? And I mean, I think it's just ways for me, at least ways of being kind way of ways of looking at your life differently way of ways of being creative ways of, you know, not just doing the, Hey, this happened tell the next generation. I think we're actually as bad as I find a lot of technology to be because it's too much information. I think it also allows there to be a stronger connection with just you and your family because you're teaching them stuff about yourself and about you that wasn't really there before. And like, is it in that you will show them videos of work you've done? Oh, he's seen a lot of stuff that I've done. Like I have to limit it obviously to some of my standup. I can't be like, Hey, here's a funny, you know, joke. It's, it's a great, perfect dick joke. You're going to love yeah. it. Son. The sodomy you're wants to kill. Yeah. Yeah. This one's the best. It's about priest rape. <laughs> you're going to love it. You know, it's, it's sort of a, but with him, I'll show him like sketches we make, videos, videos I even made as a kid and see what his interest is. But he is a uh, he's really into football, really into baseball. He's on two travel teams. I think you can tell by looking at me, I wasn't. So I'm not living you know, vicariously through my son. I just kind of let him pick what he wanted to do. And he fell in love with drums when he was five. He's been playing them for three years. And then he just started loving sports. And those are his favorite go-to things is just drums and athletics. And oh, I, su I support him fully. And drums is athletic. <laughs> when you get to he love they are, man. And like when you're sitting outside and your seven-year-old's inside, and I just started hearing Nirvana one day, and I was like, well, that's cool. I, I thought he was listening to it, honestly. But I, it's early Nirvana. It's a little more simplistic. And I went in and I realized, oh, he's playing it mm -hmm. with his teacher because his teacher was on guitar. It's the coolest feeling in the world because you your son's getting something that you loved as a child and he understands rhythm, music. I don't I wish I had that. I, I fiddle around with bass, but I, I don't have that gift. I do not have the gift of of of, of music whatsoever. Do you have a bass? I do. It's I have pretty. a Fender uh, Jazz Master. Yeah, it's it's good to look at. Yeah, it's pretty. I was like, it's pretty. And then it's, it's pretty. I was gonna say it's pretty easy, to, pretty easy music. I, I guess it's just about do you want to do it? Do you, do you feel it? Do you smoke a lot of weed? I don't know if you have to smoke a lot of weed, but no, I that helped yes, me. Yeah, I don't I don't smoke weed personally. I used to plenty, though. So when I was in junior high, I played bass a lot. And I think whatever amount of damage I did to my brain from that point until my mid well, late 20s, I kind of forgot it. Like I can pick it up and play a couple songs, but they're very, they're very dated to then, you know, it's like, Hey, who wants to hear uh lightning crashes by live? Like I can I do that on the guitar, that. like I, that stuff though, you yeah. know, like I, I, I have, or I can do um like today by smashing pumpkins on mm. guitar and, and like, and bass as well. Like, so I, cause I was learning both instruments. So all my, all my knowledge of it is dated to, the couple of years that I played. 
Nirvana was the first band I learned. I learned Polly. Uh, off oh, of cool. ne never, mi never mind. It's like song number eight off Nevermind, I think. One of the something like that. Yeah, it was so easy. I mean, Kurt's stuff is so basic. Like, is your son doing the stuff from Bleach before Dave Grohl joined? The easy, like those simple drums, or is he working on Dave Grohl's? He's doing the simple drums from Bleach and everything, but now he was work. Now he's began to work on the Dave Grohl stuff. Oh, that's is, awesome! Yeah, which is very cool to see. But the stuff that he was doing initially for the longest time has has been uh, prior. That makes a lot of sense for a teacher to teach a kid with Nirvana because the early stuff's very easy on the drum, and then it gets very not super complicated. Dave did like basic disco beats, but like way more, way better. But you're still oh, yeah. familiar with the lead singer's rhythm and stuff, so it's easier probably to to become way better because you know what you're playing along with. Yeah. Oh, and it's, it, you know, and he started on, and I mean, it's as basic as you can get. Cause you know, I, I, Meg White wasn't obviously very good and I'm not even knocking her. It was she just, when she started with playing with Jack White, you know, he was kind of teaching her what to do. So, so for him to start learning the white stripes and stuff, just to keep along with the song, that was really helpful. Um, and Meg used to date one of my friends, John, and you know, I, it's in, it's like I said, it's no insult to her, but she was as basic as you could get, but she had to keep up with an excellent guitarist. And I think that's a, a good thing to teach somebody who's starting. That's awesome. Well, did you know those guys when they were doing the white stripes? I never met Jack, but I met, uh, I met Meg while she was in the band. Um, she had just gotten out cause she was dating my friend, but, uh, yeah, she had, but I guess they weren't together the whole time either. Um, but I did know them from around Detroit, um, oh. from playing around the area and, and everything like that. So like I was aware of the White Stripes and I was aware of Jack White um, a little bit before they had obviously their elephant, I think it was, that blew up. Um, but yeah, yeah there was a lot, of, a lot of cool music that was coming out at that time. Did you think that weed fucked you up or did you a service? It's not that maybe it's not that simplistic, but how do you how do you view your experience with it and it weed in general? I think it did me a service. Um, I don't I don't look at it as a negative. I, I, I do look at it as a plant. I think that and I could be completely ignorant to this. I think that there that people can have an adverse reaction. And I think the only reason why it's called the gateway drug is because it's something that people are a little less apprehensive about. So they're willing to try first. But I think you could say the same as uh, same with alcohol. But I, I think there is something to the right amount of weed, sharing something with friends and laughing along and creating something uh, that is a lot different than every other drug I've, I've done. Because I think you can still create very well on that, on, on marijuana personally. That's been my experience. And people are like, well, the weed today is way different than the weed 30 years ago or 40 years ago. My dad was like, oh, it was like the brownest, nasty shit in the 70s. And yeah. now it's like medically grown in a laboratory with added terpenes and an extended THC. And it's like, I, I wonder if it's overdosing because like when you get blazed and like faded, that's like kind of like an overdose problem. <laughs> Yeah, like my uncle Gary, I was talking to, which um, I was almost mad when my, all my relatives were talking about the weed they've tried around Thanksgiving, and like because it's like you, you used to narc on me and get me in trouble, and everybody's talking about what gummies they legally buy in Michigan now because that's where I'm from. And uh, my uncle Gary is like, I gotta say, like it's not just it's just not the same because I ate a gummy and I went and got the mail for 25 minutes. <laughs> He said he was just standing there like enamored with his street and colors. Yeah. And to me, that sounds more like a, a, a trip than than anything. But um, I think it I honestly think it did me a service. And I think in many ways, so did LSD. And I think in many ways, so did mushrooms. I just uh, I had a real bad experience with LSD and I over, I completely abused it. And, um, but I don't, I don't think that the more, those more natural things, and especially now the microdosing, I've talked to tons of people who have PTSD, who have been in the military, who have had, who have been completely broken people. And now I've seen them and it's had a profound effect on the positivity, uh, of, of, of their, of their mental state. And I think that's, that's wonderful. 
Tom Sauer. Are you familiar with Tom Sauer? He was just on um, IRL a few nights ago. I oh that I saw the dude. Okay, so that that would be my introduction to him. That's uh, his company, obviously. Miramar. Yeah, Miramar Health is focused on like veteran rehabilitation and just like getting your head straight, feeling good. And a lot of it, at least they're delving into the psychedelic realm. They're making sure everything's legit, legalized, cool with the VA and everything. But it's like through studies. I mean, the, the studies are amazing how it helps reset. Like you still have to do the work. You still have to do the communication. But did it? I don't know what it does exactly. Like LSD, they did brain scans, fMRI scans. And like the, the neurons will all light up. Not all, but like both hemispheres of the brain light up as if it's like an infant brain. And I think that's why people say they smell color and they can hear smells and things like you get this like um synesthesia yeah or you can ex it's an experience that you really do i don't know it, it it's odd because now i know what i've taken as far as mushrooms and i know the wonderful experiences i've had on them i did a lot of lsd in the 90s where i mean you're talking I, honestly like i ballpark it between three and five hundred hits like that it was our go-to and we would buy sheets every week and we'd trip in school. And I think the max I took was uh, 13. My friend took 19. And uh, he's been a born again Christian since that night. But I, uh, I took, uh, I, I tripped for seven days and it would not stop. Like, I yeah. mean, in, I, and I mean, it was peaking hard for five of them. That was after the 13 hits? Yes. And did you, had you done like hits in the days leading up to that? I had done a couple, but I always kind of kept it a day apart because some people, I guess the way it works for them is they're able to do it daily. I was never able to get what I thought was a fun trip every day. So we usually scattered it to uh, three days a week or four days a week is how we would do it. We never, uh, we never did it almost daily. I mean, I'm sure I did a couple times, but that was never like the regimen we were on. So we would take it uh about every other day so i had i had tons of experience with it and honestly we thought the acid was going to be pretty weak and uh it wasn't you know we just thought the guy was a little shady we we, we weren't really sure who we were buying from and we were like nah let's just cut off a bunch of it because i'm sure it's probably shit anyway and the next thing you know you know my friend ray just sat in a car like it, it, you couldn't get him to do anything you could like you put on music and he just stare and we're like i don't know if he's coming back i'm still not sure if he came back in the next he left finally and this is like a day and a half later i go home and i turn on the tv and a dennis leary movie was on it might have been like the ref but he was screaming and my parents hadn't updated the house since the 70s so there's wood paneling in the basement so Dennis Leary is projecting kind of onto the wood paneling. Like, clearly, I know it's not real, but, like, the TV is just confusing my eyes. So I'm watching this, like, giant yelling wood paneling Dennis Leary. Like, I'm freaking out and I'm having hallucinations that I had never experienced to that level. And I call my friend Ray and I'm like, dude, you got to come pick me up, please. You got to do something. So, of course, he just drops over. And I get in his car and his arm is sliced open and bubbling. And I was like, what happened to you? And he goes, I just had to get the bad blood out, man. It's like, okay. Like, well, let's go. And then we just left and went driving around and we're like smoking weed, completely dangerous. Like it went too far in that particular night for it, for me to look like it had any profound or positive effect. But I like how natural mm -hmm. mushrooms are because I, and I think if they're controlled, especially not by government or Pfizer or any of that, but by people like you said, if it's controlled by people who care and they want to actually take care of the psychology of soldiers and people that have experienced trauma, I think there's very few things that are more positive than that. As far yeah, as the horror stories of overdosing are like, I think have scared a lot of people away from the substances in general, or, or at least put people on guard. Like, alcohol if you overdose on that it, you can just stop breathing and die I, like I've, i know people that have stopped breathing i, I know mm -hmm. people that or, or that had to get their stomachs pumped things like that that like would have died if they didn't so they say so like but for some reason that doesn't seem to scare society as much as like the walls were breathing and my friend sliced his arm open like i don't know why because it's both like overdosing in general is, in, is bad obviously yeah. I'll tell you, alcohol is worse. My withdrawals with alcohol. Um, the first time I had it, I was at lunch. I was in uh, 
uh, a food court in Eastland Mall in Detroit, and I was eating with my friends, and I was drinking, you know, pints in the morning before school at this point, and I was trying to eat rice, and I was shaking so badly. I didn't know if I was nervous. I didn't know whatever it was, but the rice was just flying everywhere from this Chinese food I got. So what I did was I jumped in the car. I drove down the street to this place called Piccadilly on 8 Mile that sold it to me, grabbed a pint of Bacardi Limon, slammed it, came back, and my hands were steady. And that's when I was like, oh, this this is with." And I had, I mean, I had withdrawals where I saw people that weren't there. I had delusions. I saw a room of people in my house that weren't there uh, when I was experiencing alcohol withdrawal. I had a little girl that would come to the side of my bed when I would withdraw from alcohol. Like it did far more damage to me, truthfully, than any other drug. Like I think it's an extraordinarily dangerous drug. Were you using other drugs at the time when you were withdrawing that like that would cause psychosomatic uh, imagery and stuff? <clears throat> uh, anything I could find I was doing at the time. I mean, I, you name it, uh, mescaline, peyote, uh, Valium, uh, Vicodin, Oxy had just kind of hit. Um, I was doing tons of stuff. So yeah, there was a lot of stuff in my system other than just alcohol. But my my main go to at that point, and of course, you know, weed and mushrooms, acid, all that. But I wasn't somebody who would go like, well, I'm going to just take this and this and this. Like I would take a bunch of mushrooms, but I also knew if I because acid, I couldn't do this. But if I could take a bunch of mushrooms and start flipping out, I could go and grab like, you know, a little bit of vodka or something and drink that. And it would at least soothe me. Where with acid, you're just like in it to win it. Like there's no drug that's going to trump or no drink that was going to trump that feeling inside of me. So it's almost like I didn't feel it. Um, but when I was withdrawing, I was such an alcoholic. I mean, I would bong fifths at parties as like a party trick, thinking it was cool. And it, you know, it destroyed my liver. Uh, it took me years to get the enzymes to get to get better again. I, I would chug pints and it was just a it was it was the most painful withdrawal i you know caffeine was definitely very hard because i wasn't expecting it but the alcohol withdrawal was brutal and i mean yeah i've had my stomach pump charcoal dumped on my throat waking up with it they pull a tube out but then they have to unhook you from the bed because i was arrested and it just feels like your bladder is going to explode um it, it can be vicious when it comes to to alcohol withdrawal and and deadly how did you rebuild your liver? Uh, just slowly taking care of it. That it's a one thing that's good about your liver is, especially if you're younger. And I stopped drinking at 27. Is it can come back. You can have a little bit of uh, you can have a little bit of uh, liver issues, cirrhosis. Low uh, your enzymes can you know be uh, pretty bad. And if you just kind of diet right, don't drink alcohol, take a little bit of better care of yourself. Your, your liver will rebuild itself. I, it's so funny that it's the word live, like liver. It's the thing, like yeah. a liver is like a guy that lives. That guy's yes. a liver. <laughs> it's, is it, it the most, you. I wonder if it's the most important organ in the body or something. Dude, it's, I mean, it filters all that stuff. So, I mean, for me, it certainly was, you know, because uh, it, it, it came, it, and I go, you know, I get regular physicals and I've had the same doctor forever. And, you know, he was always shocked. He's like, it's really because he didn't know if I was going to quit. He knew me since I was uh, almost 10 and he knew me like I took one of his prescriptions once that he gave me for antibiotics and I wrote 23 Valium on it. And it's like, that's not what doctors write. And it wasn't the same handwriting. So I delivered to the pharmacy and they call him. And he calls my house and he's like, I'm not going to press charges, but I just committed a felony trying to get these other drugs. So he really, I don't think he had faith that I was going to live that long. And uh, the more and more I came in and the healthier that he saw me, uh, he was really happy. What did you, what'd you do? Like what, what did you, how'd you change your mind to, to get, to do other stuff, I guess. To, to stop drinking or to do. Yeah. I think I, that term stop drinking is kind of like, eh, it's a double negative, but like, what did you do instead? Like what, how did you change your perception and change your behavior? Um, 
Well, it, and I've talked about it a bit, and I, I hope it's not ad nauseum to your viewers. It was my 13th arrest, and I was an adult this time. And I had gotten, I started abusing drugs largely because my dad had gotten Agent Orange in Vietnam, and uh, he was very, very sick starting when I was uh, 14. And he was like my hero. He was our baseball coach. He was, uh, he was everything to us. And he suffered for years off this stuff. And I know he smoked weed a few times uh, during the process of it, even though he would like, because I caught him in the basement and it's like the smell. I'm like, that's weird. And then I would find like one of my glass bowls, you know, that he had took from me. I'm like, oh, that's odd. He, it didn't end up in the trash can, you know. Um, but I had I had gotten into that, into a wave of where I was treating myself for depression, like ketamine. I was treating myself with for depression in the 90s because it really did make take away a lot of my depression, you know. So when I snorted that stuff, I just felt better. Um, so but by the time I was 27, I had messed my life up so badly and I was facing prison time that I I really had no choice but to find other ways. And really the ways I do it is just through creativity, stand-up comedy, being a dad is one of the most helpful things in the world because now I have something that's more important than me. Because even if I hate myself, which I do, I love my son, you know, and, and that that's another thing that gives me purpose and a reason to stay so sober for myself. And I, but I still support the people very much who are using these drugs to treat, to be treated properly. And I, and it, honestly, it's not something that I wouldn't, and I've said it, before it's not something that i wouldn't consider the more and more research i see because i have a lot of those issues it's just i also have the terror in my head of all the times that i didn't use it correctly or overdid it and i abused it you know yeah a lot i know exactly like one bad trip on mushrooms where i was like rolling around on the ground in the fetal position listening to my roommates fight and i was like it just kind of, I mean, I've used them since I've in the right dosage and I've kept the dosage down pretty much the whole heroic. I just don't want to misuse that stuff. It's so powerful. Mm -hmm. Like literally like mind, well, maybe figuratively mind blowingly powerful. Maybe there are some blowings going on in the mind literally too. I'm right. not sure. <laughs> right. No, you're right though. Did you ever smoke DMT or use ayahuasca? I don't think so. I've looked at the DMT. I think it was just a little bit after, but I do know I did something that I swore was named something similar. And this was probably in like 2002, maybe. So I don't know if it was even popular enough then, um, but I can't say for sure that I've ever done it. No, uh, there was a, uh, people were like robo tripping at one time too. Was that? I forget, oh, Robitussin. Yeah, but it was a it was a particular drug that was in it that they were selling in the pill form. Codeine? No, no. Um, God, I'd have to look it up. It was like the more tripping part of it, and you could robo trip, and I think that's why people were drinking so much of it because they would get this more uh, tripping feeling, and they were selling it briefly in these pills. And I remember taking it, and. 10 minutes later, I was in my buddy Dean's garage and I just projectile vomited. And then after that, I had a pretty pleasing trip of like what was left in me. But it, for a minute, I was horrified that I had just eaten poison. Mm. So it's like, I don't, so I don't know if I've ever done it, to be honest with you. And it seems like it would be an easy yes or no question, but I just, I've taken stuff that people have handed to me. So I, I don't think I've done either one of those. I, there's other stuff called like AMT. That's uh, a, I think it's alpha methyltryptamine. DMT is okay. dimethyltryptamine, and apparently that's like the Russian military uses it for their s super soldier program. I don't. This is like hearsay. I don't know if it's real or not. And okay. it'll put people in these DMT trips for like a day, for like 24 hours, like uber powerful methylene methyltryptamines. Um, I doubt that was what you had. I mean, I don't even know if that's available to the the population at large. That kind of yeah, thing. I, I, that's what I mean. Like, I have no idea. Like, I've heard of it from obviously on like your guys' show. I've heard it on uh, Rogan. I've heard a lot of people talk about it, but I don't think I had ever done it. I think ayahuasca is the one when, or, or have you taken um, ibogaine? That's like the kill the addiction drug. I hear it's like people go and they do ibogaine ceremonies and it just wrecks them, transforms them, and then they quit smoking. Things like really? that. Really. Yeah. No, never. I wish I would have because quitting. I was a three pack a day smoker, and uh, I that was just that was sheer willpower. That one. 
I was living in LA. I just went to get my third pack of cigarettes for the day in 2012. It was like $7 at the time, which may sound like nothing now, but I was like, I just spent $21 on cigarettes to sit in a room and write all day. And I just locked the door and everybody left me alone for a week. And when I came out, I never smoked again, but I, I was a dick dude for a week. Like if anybody even talked to me, like it was, there was anything would irritate me. I couldn't like even watch TV. I couldn't, I, I was just pissed for a week. And then finally I just, I didn't want to go through it again. And I just, it took me a good year and a half before I stopped craving cigarettes. I hear cinnamon helps people cut that addiction. I don't know if it's true. No, it my, it. there's something about it. Um, so you spent a week, not you, not smoking. You got the three packs in one day and then you just did seven days of just like pure, what, like nervous agony or something. It just pain. Yeah. Just utter pain, dude, sitting in a room, just locked in there, like by myself. I would get out to pee and shower and that's it. And, uh, it, that was it. And anybody that came near me would talk to me for two minutes and be like, all right, I don't want to talk to you at all right now. Dude, when you were talking about your dad in Vietnam, that's mm -hmm. my dad was in the Navy. He went into the Navy. didn't go to the, did your dad go to the jungle? Uh, he went into the jungle and he also ended up staying as a medic, which was over on the beach side, which oh. was also affected. Uh, but he stayed on as a medic because uh, he wanted to help people out. And he had, part of a psychology degree at the time. And he had, he saw a lot of addiction running rampant. And my dad was somebody who, uh, he had a lot of addiction in his family, you know, long story short, Irish dad left when he was a kid, uh, you know, like the day he was born. And, and he, so he lost a lot of friends at that time to heroin and, and a lot of the stuff going around and he kind of stuck around to deal with it. And I mean, he remembers the LSD, because he would talk to me very candidly about everything once I started opening up to him about what I was going through. Because he's the one that explained, like, you know, the delusionary tremors I was having. And he, I was very honest because I was just scared and I just was honest with him. And, uh, but yeah, he was in both, uh, he ended up on both sides of it. What does he talk a lot about, like being in the combat in the jungle? Uh, well, he died when I was 18. He got brain cancer when I was 13 uh, and then died. And But he he didn't talk much about it. He talked more about the medic side of it than the combat side. I, for, I forget. It says on his headstone um, what he was for like a sharpshooter, what he ended up being. Um, but, you know, I had to ask him like questions like, did you ever have to kill somebody? And he was like, well, it, it wasn't really a choice. You know, it was just they're pointing something at me. I, I have to survive and he was drafted. Um, but he, he wasn't huge into talking about it, but he, he didn't have the um, PTSD like a lot of my friends' dads had. I mean, a lot of my friends' dads had to sleep in a room by themselves that was locked. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends' dads were far more disturbed from the war than uh, my dad was. I concerns me because like you were saying it, it affected you like, haven't seen your dad go through that shit with the agent orange. Like what, what agent orange is that? Was that what they were dropping in like the napalm and stuff? Yeah, they would, uh, what they would do is uh, the fields and all over, they would put it into uh, it, it would, they'd spray it onto the plants to kill all the plants, but it was also poisonous to humans. So once all the plants were dead, you could see the Viet Cong because they'd be hiding up at, you know, they were, it was an entirely different kind of warfare that America was not used to at all. So what they did was they sprayed all that poison in there and then once they were able to kill off some of the plant life, that allowed them to come in as soldiers and try to find the, the Viet Cong. And it had this profoundly horrible effect. It was a lot like mustard gas in World War II. And right now the VA is just starting to pay off mustard gas. Like they, they want you to die and they don't want to give you anything. They gave my family nothing. My dad lost everything. They might, we fought for it. Uh, it, it was, it, it was, it was an endless battle and it's a shame what they do to to our own to their own people that's why you see skid row filled with soldiers soldiers Holy disgusting fuck. so they and i mean put you, you got choppy it's choppy again oh and you're coming back you hear me now i can yes oh thank you, god okay you, after the skid row you said that and then they put and they put 
Um, the Skid Row, you know, you see that, and how it's sad what they do to soldiers. And with this, they had um, my dad would tell me about like they wanted you to get used to if you were ever gassed by uh, anybody in the Viet Cong. So your whole thing was you walk into this this room that's filled with poisonous gas, take your mask off, like you're building up some kind of an immunity, and you're just standing there getting poisoned. And then you walk, you, then you get out, but you see how long you can take it. And that was just part of training. That was the Agent Orange? I don't know if it was Agent Orange specifically, but it was, you know, noxious gas. Dude, it's so crazy what you just said that the government would rather the soldiers just die after the war so they don't have to pay off their families. Like mm -hmm. they don't have to pay their disabilities. That's like utilitarian and not insane to think that that would that would be true. I mean, I don't think they're like, God, I hope they all. But it's like, oh, what a what a burden the cost of these people. Oh, that's so gross. But that's what it is. And I've talked to so many families who have a lot of started to get paid out. To us, the last time I talked to the VA, because a lot, you know, the VA, a lot of them are veterans. They want to help you. Like they do. They just have to get approval from high up and they think it sucks. Like I've been in a room where I'll just be blunt. They were going to write a check for $400,000 and it was 10% of what my dad lost paying for his own surgery because they didn't cover him for anything. He paid out of pocket and insurance called it a pre existing condition. So as a result of it, he, had, he was paying cash to stay alive a guy who came from nothing earned his way up served the country and the only thing they ever gave my dad was a folded flag and a gun salute at his funeral it ended up leading to my mom's suicide you know a lot of stuff that that was this domino effect that i experienced and as a result of that i saw like so many different families that had suffered from the exact same thing and I remember the last time I talked to somebody at the VA it was earlier last year because I'm, I'm still not giving up. I'll give the money that I get to a soldier's family that needs it. I don't care. It's the principle of the fact that they took something that was my father's life and never gave it and gave us anything. And they do that to so many people that have served this country that it's a disgrace. That's all I you know. That's all I care about. Yeah, it I'd is, like to see it that. more private. Would, What's that? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I apologize. Oh, yeah. I, I don't care. What were you going to say is probably way better. I'm just happy no. to see things getting privatized and like private companies trying to pick up the slack, working in conjunction with the VA and trying to at least at least help people phys physically and mentally, if not financially. You know, we could do like a giant GoFundMe. To be honest, we could coordinate huge veteran paybacks and stuff. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I was talking to a guy last night, I, oddly enough, after the show. Oh, and what? Oh, sorry. What I was going to say was with my mom. I, when I talked to them earlier last year, the guy on the phone said, the reason why they denied it was your mom didn't fill out the paperwork correctly the third time. And the time before that, it was because my brother and I were 18 when he died. So we were legally adults, even though he had been sick for five years leading up to that. So at that point they were like, well, which is just the, the dumbest thing you can do. And uh, they said he, she didn't fill out the paperwork right. And he goes, I've looked at what your dad did for this country. And I just want to say, like, thank you so much for everything that he did. And I'm so sorry that this has been this process for you for so long. And I'm, and you could tell it was really heartfelt because they don't want to see that. They want to help other soldiers. They think it's they think it's as much bullshit as anybody else. And like you were talking with the microdosing last night, there's a guy in the front row that I was kind of joking around with. And it turned out he was, uh, he, he had PTSD. He was in the Navy. And he said that he was a biker, had a lot of problems, extremely violent. And ever since he's been microdosing, he's become a very happy person. But he said it's a mix of that and talk therapy. And it's gotten him there. And, you know, this is the first time that I think that a lot of those organizations are helping soldiers get that proper mental health. Because he's like, you know, you would have talked to me 10 years ago. I was a monster. And he's like, today, I I'm, I'm, I feel good. I'm, I'm genuinely happy. And he was like a really happy. I mean, he looked dangerous. But he was a very, very happy person to talk to. But you can tell he went through it. Yeah, I like seeing that in people. Yeah. I wonder if, like, I'm, I'm definitely concerned that the Federal Reserve is printed, or the United States has 33, 34 trillion in debt. That's concerning. But, like... If we were to print a bunch of money for veterans for just for payouts from the VA, I know that throwing money at it is not the answer, but 
I think it would be, I would support personally, like, like the money's so fake anyway, and the inflation's insane anyway. It's either going to be a huge solution where we change it by increase our GDP by magnitudes by switching to hydrogen, and then like we're going to have 300 billion in debt instead of 33 trillion. It's going to be some drastic fix or no fix, is kind of where I'm at. So, like, can we print two trillion dollars and give it to the veterans? Is that. Dude, I feel the same as you, and a lot of people will argue against that with inflation and everything else, but look at what we're giving away anyway, and I realize stuff going to Ukraine, people think is like a check and whatever. It's not. I mean, it's tanks, it's weapons, it's this, it's, it's, a, it's you know, uh, goods that may equal billions of dollars, but at the same time, we are giving that to foreign countries. We are doing things, at what, and, and at this point, like you said, money's so pretend you know, China owns half of our debt. We have, we, it's such a, a huge problem that we're all kind of living off of a pretend currency anyway, that really what difference does it make? And at the end of the day, what is gas going to get 20 cents higher? I mean, we're already screwed. What, I mean, there's, there, I can't imagine seeing a way out of this. So why not add to a, a little bit before we figure out how to fix the problem? Yeah, my my solution, my my number one potential solution is if we start um, transitioning into a hydrogen hybrid energy economy, where because at, at uh, Rice University they figured out how to use this technology called flash jewel heating, where they'll take carbon trash of any kind, any kind of carbon, they put it in a tube with seven thousand degree electricity, they'll they'll let, pulse it with electricity, turn it into black powder graphene, but they also produce a kilogram of hydrogen for every. $4.50 of graphene they're getting out of it. So not only is it a profitable, and this is after the cost of electricity and everything is factored in, you get $4. So they're profiting oh. off of creating the hydrogen fuel. They're actually getting um, a tangible, profitable result. It actually inverts the model because it's always cost money to make hydrogen. Now they're getting money for making the hydrogen. If we can make a hybrid system where your car can run on a hydrogen or gasoline thing, that might be, and we can turn like charging up, up your car to like nine cents and then like to heat your home is like a dollar 80 a month or something all of a sudden it it doesn't really matter the debt yeah maybe it's 33 trillion but since things only cost pennies that's really only 30, 330 billion like the value of the the number is it's not so much the number it's the value of the of the products that are involved with the number you know so oh yeah it, I didn't even know that existed until just now. Dude, it's at Rice University. The guy's name is James Tour. If you okay. want to look him up, I interviewed no, I him. He, he's the number two interview on this channel that I did two a month and a half ago or something. Right. Right. It's very, very exciting. He's got a, a contract with the Department of Defense, his company, one of his companies. That's pretty, that's very, very promising, actually. And then it also gets us off the dependence of like global Saudi Arabian oil and Chinese oil and which is a huge problem. I mean, we're not able to drill in our own country. We're not able to use stuff over there. And I'm somebody who I personally love classic cars. So it's like, I, I don't want to see them go away, just my own personal preference. And I certainly don't want, though, the government in 2026 to tell you, you know, what kind of car you're allowed to drive or anything, you know, that all of that just seems terrifying to me and seems to be this level of control that I have zero interest in. I think if it's your life, you should be able to enjoy the things you want to enjoy. I mean, there should be a limit to it. But like you said, if you have that, we're freeing up so much for other people. I mean, groceries now, I think everybody's talked about the fact that $200 in groceries used to be something that you'd need like eight people to bring to your car. And now it's a tiny little shopping bag. Like, you know, you go to CVS and buy eight things and you're like, oh, it's $148. That's insane. You know, and it's. It, Oh, and it's primarily because the cost of fuel to get the things from the plant to the plant, to the factory, to the grocery store, from the farm, to the processing to the grocery. So like if that's cut by a hundredth, if it costs a hundredth, like one cent instead of a dollar. You're, you're saving on everything. Yeah, that's that's and, and the, the people at first I was like, well, fuck, but then the oil industry is going to say, no, we're not going to give up that kind of power. But you can still harvest the oil and turn it into graphene with the same process of flash jewel heating i have hope no it actually gives me hope for the first time in a while involving that entire entire industry because there's there is too much power being given to too many people and the at the end of the day what good is it doing you know i i don't everything seems to be tax tax upon tax and upon tax and i look at what's going on in the country and it's like there's just little stuff that bothers me like there's a casino open in every terrible neighborhood now. 
throughout the country. I've noticed that. I've noticed there's all these ways to tax what's already been taxed, and there's a way to take what's already been, you know, took. And the more and more I see it, I just, I find it horrible. And there's got to be a way to figure out a way to go, look, there's a way that we can live as people without everybody living in fear, paycheck to paycheck, and terrified of where their next meal's coming from. And I, obviously, that's not everybody, but I think there's a huge portion of the population just in the United States, that that's a very serious concern for. And just what you said could change their lives profoundly for the better. Yeah, man. And the spreading English, that's a that's cool. Like the culture. That's why I like comedy is so great and music and TV and stuff, because if everyone can have a common language, you're less concerned that your neighbor's going to attack because at least you can talk to them or, or the guy down the road. Yeah, which is something that we've lost a bit, you know, and I think that that's yeah, for sure. Did you ever get into gambling? Did you ever go through a phase? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. What yeah, was it? Enough... What, what games did you play? Uh, I games. used to That's funny. do, yeah, roulette for a while, uh, just because for some reason, I for I, I never really liked it. Like, long story short, I guess long story long, but my uncle ran Bally's in Atlantic City. He ran the hotel division. So I grew up, every summer, I would go to the boardwalk. And like when I was like eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, I would see like, oh, like Don Rickles is coming, Sammy Davis Jr. Like it was very much its own thing, but you could fly there for 45 bucks and people would be having somewhat fun because it was more regulated, which I think is a good thing with that personally. But I, I always saw people losing still. And it was something that never attracted me because I remember seeing just very sad stuff and um i was somebody who would play roulette and i would just play red black green red black maybe green and usually i'd walk away with a couple hundred bucks but then there were points where i finally got hit a little bit of a depression played some high-end slots you know threw in some money uh you know and of course i immediately had the taxes taken out because i was terrified but it's like oh i won thirty-two thousand dollars thirty-two thousand dollars i won fifty thousand dollars money that i never thought that i would ever win off of a slot because and all of a sudden you think it's like a magic trick and you can do it again and again and i learned pretty quickly like oh you don't it's just a it's a gimmick and it's just there to rob you and and that's why i, I i'm happy i was able to stop quickly but i kept seeing things when i was there um and how it was designed to see like money that has been taxed already that somebody got from work going into a machine that's going to get paid that's going to be taxed again it's going to go to a, it, it all just seems so crazy to me. And then you're essentially giving nobody, you're not giving them a product. You're not really even giving them a release. You're giving them a dopamine addiction. And the more we get into computers, the way they're designed to grab you and keep you zoned in and entranced into those machines is, is terrifying. And I would watch people win even around me a hundred grand and walk out 20 down. It was, it was nuts. And, I, I see that in in so many inner city areas now and, and all over the country where it's not like a special trip to Vegas anymore or a special trip to Atlantic City anymore where you have some fun. It's a crippling addiction that's just adding on to stuff that's already plaguing America. Man, you were saying how social media like Instagram, when you go on the app, you, you pull it down and it reloads your feed. It's like ding, 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 ding. And then the new thing pops up in the feed. And I'm picturing like in the future, what are they going to start charging people a penny every time they refresh their feed? And it's like, ding, ding, ding. Oh my God. Like that, obviously probably not. If we can get ahead of the curve and be like, that's a human rights abuse. You can't do that to people. Right. It's an addictive, so, you know, an addictive process with gambling. I, I enjoyed like playing cards with my friends for like pennies or for just for paper clips or whatever we would just the whole like i got you ha ah, i tricked you yeah i did i did get it Ooh, i would do that as well yeah but then i would went to the casino similarly there was a period where i was actually pretty depressed too and right you know after i got black red pilled so so deep red that it was black it seemed black to me on uh, 2011 and i was yeah. like i'm just gonna make my rent gambling man because i'm good at it and one day i took this dude's money playing poker at a table because it's easier to take a bunch of people's money than to take the house's money because the people didn't really know what they were doing as much right and this guy stood up and threw his cards down and i could tell i took money that he couldn't afford to lose right and i, I quit after that it was like no Good one's winning yeah i'm glad tim loves to play so it's still around and i still enjoy the camaraderie of hanging out and being like gotcha but like i'll just throw my money away now i don't really play to 
I don't, I don't know. I don't play to win as much these days as, as to have fun. I think you're cutting out. I hope you can still hear me saying this because what I'm saying is fucking awesome. Sorry. Can oh, you good. hear me? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Um, I was saying a really awesome shit that it's less about playing to win. I'm just playing to have fun. But if you're playing gambling just to have fun, you're going to lose. Like if you're not playing religiously by the numbers, you're more likely to lose. I've found so. Uh, I don't know. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And it's, it's well, and the more you win, the more you think you can win, which then turns into the more you can lose. And I was honestly sitting in Vegas one day and I, this was uh, a few years ago and I had never, ever played a slot that was high end and really any slots anyway. But I, this, uh, my friend's girlfriend was talking to me and I, I was just annoyed and I was just turned around and I put money into a machine and I was like, oh shit, it's $50. So, but I, I hit the button and I won six grand and it said hand pay. And then I'm like, why can't I get my money out? I, I had no idea, you know, like what was going on. And they came out, took taxes, whatever. But I was like, oh, you, and then the next one I hit was three grand. Then the one I hit a little bit after that was 32 grand. And I was like, holy crap, like I'm obviously very skilled. And then you find that you can, like, once you go and you lose 50 in a day, that's when you go, oh, I, I, I don't have a special skill at all. I just kept thinking that I would hit and, and I won't. And it, it sucks because I, I never got to the point where it took over my life or was destitute or anything like that. But it was like that one moment where I kept winning, then I realized how much you could lose <laughs> after like this hot streak. And it's, it's just terrifying. Yeah, man. I did lose money as well. In addition to taking that guy's money, there were a couple of days I walked out. It's just like, and I was like gam gambling with money I didn't have to lose. That's like, no, 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 never. I learned that kind of the hard way. Well, because now, now you're depressed and you're desperate. And that's the worst feeling in the world, honestly. And you can't, it's harder to win against people if you, if you know you can't lose it because it's like you're not able to take the risks uh, associated with like putting people on their back heels and knocking them out of the game. I've noticed that just psychologically it's challenging. If I like, I'm afraid to lose my money, you know, you gotta kind of be bold with it. I had a super chat from Dick Dickerson. Okay. I was pissed at Dave for a while because he left Kumia's show, but I understand. And now he's one of my favorites. Please do more skits. Ian, you rule as well. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And yeah, we're working on a bunch of new ones and Ian was uh, in one of my favorite skits we've ever done. And I hope he's going to come on and do more. Cause I want you back on normal world. Let's do that, dude. I'll fly you down there whenever. I mean, Dude, not you were literally. So good. Yeah, we should. So it's the first episode of Normal World on mm -hmm. YouTube. There's a link in the description on the YouTube video, but it's on Normal World and it's uh, Drugtopia. It was great. Yeah, it was. You're you played it like I said before. It was like this almost Robert Downey Jr. in less than zero uh, sort of. Uh, and I just I just love the way that it was played because it was just that great juxtaposition of all the new modern shows of. Uh, you know, like kids on drugs and glorifying it. Then the next thing is more and more glorifying, dr you know, euphoria and all that. And like you played it just so serious that it made the comedy work so well. <laughs> yeah. if, it was, if it was played in any other way, I don't think it would work. It's why there's scenes where it's like, you know, like my parents are having an, uh, throwing an orgy for my 14th birthday if you want to come. And, you know, it's like, I don't know. I might have to go to rehab again. But if you just play that dead on. <laughs> Like the the way you guys were all playing it, it was yeah. so perfect because there wasn't like there wasn't one nod to the camera, and that's what I loved about it was like just this is dead serious a, a show coming to HBO. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> I'm so down. I, I I could literally like on a cup Thursday fly down for a couple days and shoot on the weekend. Do you guys shoot on the weekends ever? Or do you do weekdays? I th we do weekdays usually, but I think we're gonna start doing that because we just want to get more sketches out. And it's really, really tight during the week because we have we, we're pretty small staffed, honestly. We only have about five or six people, like you saw, and we have, you know we have to write the whole show, put that together, have everything ready, then the sketches on top of it. So I think we're trying to figure out a way to find more room and to get more people in on the sketches because they're the most fun to make. And I, I grew up loving SNL, but like Kids in the Hall because I lived in Detroit, we used to get the uh, CBC feed. So I've always loved like any any level of sketch comedy since I was young. So that's like the coolest shit we do, in my opinion. Yeah, it's so, so great. I mean, especially you. when one hits. Oh, my God, it becomes iconic.
Oh yeah. It's nice to watch something keep growing. Like even the other day, like we did the Woking Dead, it was a fairly simple idea. And we're like, we'll see how it goes. And it just keeps building, which is nice. And one was just a real simple thing of the book it where there's like the pedophilia in the middle of it. So we just have Stephen King talking to his publisher and it's me and Matt McClowery. And like, we're like, we'll see how it goes. And like, slowly it's growing. And I love reading the comments because you get this like weird defense of King where they're mad at you. Or there's people that are like really happy you finally pointed it out. And it's like, it's really just a sketch for a Halloween episode where the guy put something disgusting in a book and we kind of wanted to mock it. Isn't that, that's true, like, the, in It, I never read the book, I saw the made-for-TV movie, and there was nothing, no even allusion to child sex, but, like, in the in the book, the, the kids are, like, 14 or 12 or 13, and then, yep. what, does the girl has, like, sex with all the other boys or something? Yes, all, uh, uh, they're all 11, and and it's, it's like, I want to put your thing in me, so it's me as the, you know, I'm the editor, and he's like, was it the climactic battle at the end? I'm like, no, th there were climaxes, there were about six of them. <laughs> But it wasn't that. It was, uh, and he's like, "Well, can you think of a better way to try?" I, I need a literary device to show how they go into adulthood. And I'm like, "I don't know, a birthday party?" It's like, <laughs> "Oh, with a clown? Yeah, that's great." Like, like I'm just trying to think of any way we can change it. And, and so it's like the whole joke is just the fact that he's just so adamant about keeping it in. To at the end, we're just fighting. Where I'm like, "You should set it in Maine. That's really original." He's like, "Yeah, I will. You believe me? I will." <laughs> I, you know. All right. I love it. I'm gonna, I think we've been going for, oh, we've been going for over an hour, man. This has been fucking right. awesome. Cool. I, I just arbitrarily cut it off after an hour, but I, I, I'm good to go, bro. You want to well, appreciate it. Did you have anything else you wanted to br talk about or bring up or anything? Uh, no, I've enjoyed the conversation a lot, man. I really appreciate it. It's and, uh, awesome. Yeah. So I, I'd love to do it again. And, um, if anybody does actually, if you don't mind me plugging Normal World, please do. Um, if you haven't seen it, and I and I, I really do want you back on your your acting was, was seriously just incredible. Um, and I'm not blowing smoke. There's just it's nice to work with people who get what what they're doing, and that was so fun the way that you played it. Um, but check out Normal World. It's on YouTube. You can just subscribe for free. You can also subscribe to the Blaze using the code Normal Twenty. But we're putting stuff out there right now for free, so. Honestly, just check it out there. Hit subscribe because um, we're just trying to build the show up and we're getting more and more viewers, more and more subs. And the people that if you already are a sub, thank you very much for giving it, it the opportunity. And like the video, you guys share the video with your friends and relatives and loved ones and all those other people maybe that you haven't talked to in a long time because this video is going to just going to knock them on their ass. It was so great. Uh, and then what else? Uh, follow Dave and me. We'll follow yeah. us all over the place. Yeah, DaveLander.com if you want to see me live. And uh, yeah, and definitely. And oh. thank you, dude. I'm really glad you're doing this. Yeah, man. Do you have any dates coming up? Any live dates? I do. Um, well, tonight I'll be at the Syracuse Funny Bone. And then I'll be in Indianapolis at the Irving next week. Hobart, Indiana. And then uh, Virginia Beach Funny Bone. And then New Year's Eve, I will be in Huntsville, Alabama at Stand Up Live. And that's DaveLandau.com. Yes, sir. Good to see you, my man. Good to see you, my friend. Great talking to you as always.